Thank you everyone for coming to this session today. So the tagline for this is a vision to improve New York City's food system. And you may wonder what a food system is. You might have heard of the food pyramid or food chains, but not really know what a food system is. And basically a food system is all the pieces that get our food from it being grown until eating it and then what happens after we eat it. So it's agricultural production, processing, distribution, consumption, and post-consumption. And in the Food Works plan, these are all of the visions that are outlined in the plan. I want to let you know, um, oh, so what happens in the plan is that all the actions do three things. They will help improve the health of New Yorkers, they will help us have a flourishing, stable economy, and they will also help the natural environment. The food system that we have now was developed over the past several centuries, and particularly over the past several decades, to accommodate a rapidly growing population, and it actually has allowed us to feed more and more people. Yet at the same time, it's had a lot of unintended consequences. The current food system that we have now is high in energy use, has a lot of waste through all of the phases, and contributes to, it has an aging farming population with very few farmers under the age of 35, and most farmers over the age of about 56. So we are actually at a loss for our farmers. Loss of farm land to development and degradation, and an obesity epidemic that is threatening to reverse decades worth of public health that has moved us forward. So the very system that has been meant to sustain us has imposed costs on our health, our economy, and our environment. So this legislation is trying to put forward key legislative changes, public and private partnerships, infrastructure changes that will help to change our food system. I want to tell you that we actually have an education program here called Earth Friends, Exploring the Whole Story of Food. And what we do is teach children about food systems, and this is the way that we do it with children. So we talk about how food is grown, transported, changed or processed, packaged, how we can buy it in different places, cooking and eating it, and we can either find a way to get it back into the cycle or exit the cycle. So this is how we educate children about food systems. So now back to food work to tell you a little bit about, for those five phases of the food system that it outlines, what it actually entails doing. So for food, agricultural production, agricultural production involves growing crops and raising the animals for food. A wide array of people and organizations produce food for New Yorkers. New York State has 36,000 farms and over 7 billion acres of farmland, yet that's down from over 30, um, 30 million acres not so long ago. And that's actually a quarter of our state's land. While rural farms throughout the state are part of our food production, most of New York City's food is actually trucked from around the country and even comes from around the globe. Yet, there is actually food now and more and more food being produced within our five boroughs from urban gardens, rooftop gardens, beekeeping operations, and hundreds of community gardens. This just shows the decrease of farms that have happened in New York State. And even over just the past um, a decade, a little over a decade ago, from 97 to 2007, out of the states in our region, New York State has actually had the largest decrease in farms. We have farmland protection in place, but it's not as strong and not as much funds that the other states have. So the, fund, the states that actually have the most funding towards it are the states that have actually had the increase during this decade. So acknowledging this will help New York make a change. There are some positive things. Farmers markets in New York City, for all of you who live in New York City, have probably seen more and more farmers markets over the past several decades. Here's a map of where all the farmers markets are in New York City. And the acceptance of, of electronics benefits transfer or food stamps at farmers markets was basically non-existent only a few years ago in 2005 and is very rapidly increasing. So people can have opportunities to shop like this. Also, the Urban Design Lab at Columbia University is trying to figure out what our food shed is. So what makes sense to produce within 50 miles, 100 miles out from New York City? As you can see, we go out towards the west because it's pretty much ocean to the east. And there's also more and more food, as I said, being produced in New York City. So there's community gardens all over New York City and more and more are being started. So for Food Works, the two big goals for um, agricultural production are to preserve and increase 
regional food production, and also to increase food being produced for New Yorkers right here in New York City. The second phase is processing. And processing is, much, is, is about food being changed. Basically, food can be changed as simply as washing it and bagging some fresh produce, or as complicated as making something like breakfast cereal. Right now, there are many different things that happen and a lot of people involved in the food processing that happens to get the food to New York. We are trying to start more and more, and in food works, we're trying to start more and more local food processing. So we can have food processing of fresh foods going on right here in New York City. And one of these is in East Harlem, it's La Marquetta, La Marquetta and it is a local food processing plant where small companies, such as Hot Bread Kitchen, can make products that then can be made in New York and then sold to New Yorkers. And this is important because the food that gets processed by big food companies actually tends to have a lot more added fat. As you can see in here, this is the fat that's available per capita and the obesity rates that we all know are going up. So you can see as the amount of fat goes up, also the amount of obesity has gone up. And basically the same thing, sugar has a slow, steady increase. And even though it doesn't look like that big of an increase, it's actually from 120 to 140 pounds on average that people are eating a year. So it's an extra 20 pounds of sugar. So we can see how this goes together. So for food processing, the goals in Food Works are to generate growth and employment in food manufacturing, increase regional products being processed in New York City, and reducing the environmental impact associated with all the phases of food processing in New York City. So then the third phase is distribution. And distribution is basically getting our foods from place to place. So it's not only how food travels, but also um, where it ends up when we are actually selling it and buying it. And it could be anything from large supermarkets to bodegas, food cooperatives, community-supported agriculture, which is where people can buy a share in a farm, and then get a share of what that farm produces throughout the growing season. This is a picture of Hunts Point, and this is the largest produce market in New York City, in the Bronx. So basically, at least two-thirds of the pro all produce that's in all places in New York City comes through here, and basically one of the big pushes in Food Works is to actually do a large project that would basically upgrade this because it's right now very inefficient. All of the, those are all the long buildings that are there. And then the buildings are not large enough to house all of the produce that they need. And obviously they need to keep the produce refrigerated. So they have all those trucks that are lined up right outside the building are actually extra refrigerator space for food to come in. And what you can't see in this picture is there's actually train tracks because they're trying to start to uh, train some food in. And the tr those actual portable trucks, or those trucks that are really just sitting there in storage have to be moved in and moved out. So it's a, 300, a $350 million project to try to redo this, make it much more energy efficient and much more efficient at getting the produce into New Yorkers. And so for distribution, the main goal is basically to improve the infrastructure that supports distributing our food around New York City. The next phase is consumption. Consumption is the phase of the food system that defines what and where New Yorkers eat and has an impact on our health outcomes associated with these choices. Our food environment, where we live and work, has a large impact on what we consume. Additionally, the affordability of food greatly impacts our choices. Over one million New Yorkers are food insecure, meaning they rely, at least in part, on government assistance for their food. The city also provides nearly one million institutional meals every day in schools, senior centers, and other locations. There's also a growing trend towards consumption of meals at restaurants and takeout establishments. Currently, over half of our food is consumed away from home. So this shows what are termed food deserts in New York City. So these are places where it's basically hard to get access to the healthy food that we all know will keep people healthy. So you can see where those places are. It's basically central Brooklyn, it's nor um, Harlem and northern Manhattan, south and central Bronx, and also some in, in Staten Island. Now look at that. And now we're going to look at obesity rates by neighborhoods. So look at adult obesity in New York City. The darker the purple means more obesity. And as you can see, what ends up being out, out on here is that the rates are basic, the obesity rates basically go with the places where there are food deserts. So it shows that what food people have accessible to them 
really ends up determining what they eat. The city is starting programs that will actually help New Yorkers to be able to get more fresh food. And one is the Fresh Initiative that is trying to get more supermarkets in. And the second is Green Cards that Lori is funds and is going to be talking about. So you can see all the red areas are where Green Cards um, can be. And these are, she's going to talk all about, these are fr places for people to get fresh fruits and vegetables. And as you can see, they overlie perfectly on the areas where now people don't have access to food. Those are also the places where there are food deserts that when the Department of Health does surveys are the places that are most likely that people would say that they had zero fruits and vegetables on the previous day. And it's because they don't have access to them and they can't get them. So we can just see that over the past 50 years we have had a very large increase of the amount of food that is uh, bought outside of the home. Here are the types of food outlets we have in New York City. So we have a lot of restaurants, and you can see green carts are more and more that are getting in there as a really good food source. So there's more green carts than there are farmers markets and even community-supported <laughs> agriculture combined. So we hope that people have opportunities to Something shop with new to me. <laughs> what? <laughs> and here's the green carts. So here are... Um, some of the school food numbers, and Kristen's going to be talking a little bit more about school food and what's happening in school food in New York City. So for consumption, the goals for Food Works are to create a healthier food environment, to strengthen the safety net of hunger and nutrition programs, improve the nutrition of institutional meals, and improve the quantity and quality of opportunities for food, nutrition, and cooking knowledge so that people can learn how to use these foods once they get access to these healthy foods. And that brings us to the last part of the food system, which is post-consumption. Post-consumption is the phase of the food system that manages the byproducts from all parts of the food system, such as food scraps used for cooking oil, water, from washing and other processing, and packaging materials. Approximately one-fifth of the city's waste is organic matter from food scraps. Another 36% of the waste is recyclable materials, such as food packaging. Some of the waste is recycled, and a very small portion is currently being composted. Most of the byproducts generated by New York City's food system are sent to landfills or incinerators. And just to show you, this is a complex breakdown of all of the different waste that goes into the New York City waste stream. But to try to make it more simple, 41% could be composted. So there are many pilot compost programs basically to collect compost in farmers markets, which has been going on at Union Square for a very long time. And there are now more farmers markets starting to, be, to collect compostable scraps for New Yorkers to do that. So we can try to get a larger part of that percentage that could be composted to actually be composted. Another 36% could be recycled. So we could get more of that actually being recycled. And here at Teachers College, for those of you who are not here recently, we have started a really big recycling initiative to hopefully get more of the waste that's produced here at Teachers College recycled. That would actually really reduce all of our waste by a lot because then there would only be 23% left that we would have to deal with. And hopefully we won't have something like this. <laughs> so the goals for post-consumption are to de decrease the waste throughout the whole food system and increase resource recapture into the food system, such as composting and other things. So really the next steps are for Food Works. This was just launched, I didn't say before, in November of 2010. And the committee that worked on it worked on it from about 2009 through 2010. So some of these initiatives are getting started. One thing that has actually been being worked on for a long time but got a boost by this is to have a wholesale farmer's market for mid middle-sized farmers to be able to bring their produce into Hunts Point that we showed to actually be able to get more regional food through Hunts Point. And now we're going to go on to the other panelists that were already introduced by Nancy. But basically, so you understand how the flow is, this was the overview of Food Works. And then Kristen Mancinelli is going to talk ab about child nutrition reauthorization and the process that we tried to get the voice out for all New Yorkers that was with government and other agencies. And then Lori Tisch will talk specifically about green carts and the role that they are playing to get more access to healthy foods into communities that need it. And then we're ending with the hope of our future, which is Sharon Wan talking about working with youth to get them involved in policy and system change, because if we can get our youth involved, we can change the future. Thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Mancinelli. Um, 
as it says here, I work at City Harvest, and I've been there for about two and a half years, and about a year and a half of that time, I spent coordinating this effort, uh, the New York City Alliance for Child Nutrition Reauthorization. Um, and I just want to ask, who has heard of the Child Nutrition Reauthorization? Okay, folks. Um, those of you who have heard of it, if you could think back to about 2004, I know it's a stretch, had you heard of the Child Nutrition Reauthorization then? No. Okay. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> one of the things that I would like to share is kind of how all of this came to be at the forefront of city government and also federal government and public attention. Um, and first I just want to kind of describe what the Alliance was. So in about March of 2009, as we thought the Child Nutrition Reauthorization would happen in September of 2009, um, groups in New York City formed an alliance. And prior to this, um, well actually I should step back and say the reauthorization occurs every five years in Congress. Um, and so the previous one was in 2004. This one should have occurred in 2009, but there was a delay. Um, and so at the moment when we were gearing up to advocate on this bill, that was about March of 2009. And previously in New York City, a lot of organizations that were concerned about child nutrition be they anti-hunger organizations like the Food Bank for New York City and City Harvest, or organizations that were more concerned with nutrition quality. Um, they had done advocacy work on this bill, but um, not together. And so one of the things that actually was recommended to us by New York City government, um, Council Member Robert Jackson in particular, who's chaired the Education Committee, um, and we'll talk a little bit about school food, the Education Committee will often call hearings around school food, um, they suggested to us, the organizations and the advocates, that we get together and, and do a campaign together um, so that we didn't have so many different requests to New York City government and to our Congress members that would be competing requests. Um, so at that time, we, we did come together and form this alliance, NYC for CNR, um, and this was our purpose. And so just to give you kind of the overview, the Child Nutrition Reauthorization will update every five years the school lunch program, school breakfast program, um, and meals that are served to children in daycare centers, child care centers, and also the WIC program for women, infants, and children. Um, at this moment, in the, in the 2009 reauthorization, we actually had a New York senator and a New York City representative on the committees in each chamber that would reauthorize this bill. So that was a really good um, uh, power structure for, for New York. Um, at the time, the recession was at its height, poverty and unemployment were very high, and so city and state budgets were suffering, so there was actually a real need to bring in federal dollars into the city. Um, the school meal program is a, is a great way to do that. Um, and I'm sure you're probably all aware that in, uh, in 2009, well, maybe you're not aware exactly of the numbers, but in 2009, the, um, the participation in the food stamp, or SNAP program, was nationally around 33 million people, and now it's 43 million. Um, so it's been a tremendous increase. Um, and the same increase has been seen with free and reduced price meals for children in schools. And then um, the public awareness piece around childhood obesity and nutrition. And so um, just to give you a sense of kind of what this alliance was, you know, City Harvest took on the role of coordination, um, and we sent out an invitation to comment, to draft priorities, things we would like to see changed in the school meal program. For example, um, children who are in families that have up to 185% of the poverty level, um, which is in the twenty-seven dollars or $28,000 range for a family of three, I believe, um, they cannot get free meals. They have to pay. Um, in New York City, it's a quarter. Uh, but those children could really benefit from free meals. And so one thing we wanted to do was eliminate that category and give all of those children free meals. Um, so we sent out an invitation to comment on priorities like that and invited others to give their priorities. What we ended up with after face-to-face -face meetings and reaching out to other groups was a very long consensus document. It had about 27 different things we wanted to see changed. Um, and so that will give you a sense that, you know, we weren't doing advocacy in the way of, asking our Congress members to really make all of these changes. We were doing much more around building a coalition and working with people and raising awareness, especially in New York City. So that's what I'm gonna focus on now. Um, these were our four goals, and you can see that they align somewhat with the Food Works goals. Um, 
Food Works in the consumption piece will talk about hunger and food insecurity, um, food deserts, the fact that people don't have access to affordable, healthy food. Um, and schools are one way to bring in that food. Um, ensuring that children have access to nutritious food, reducing obesity, um, and then supporting the regional farm and food economies, which we talked a little about as well. Um, and this is just a sampling of members that were part of the alliance. And so we ended up with about 85 organizations that participated. I would say about 15 of those participated very actively, calling their Congress members all the time. Um, and you know, about another 15 were very willing to include materials in their meetings on other issues. So there was a, a food film festival um, that an organization in the South Bronx put on called The Point. Um, and they, at their food film festival, also distributed materials about this bill. So there was a real sense of um, community engagement around this, around this issue. Um, and then the rest of my talk is going to be about New York, what New York City did. So um, as you see here, Chris Quinn did a tremendous amount of work, and I'll show you some things. Um, the borough president, the city council uh, held a hearing about their resolution calling on Congress to update the child nutrition programs. So I mean, I don't know how many of you are very aware, but a resolution in city council is um, a wonderful thing to kind of set priorities and say what the council is really interested in. Um, but it's not such a, such a purposeful legislative vehicle, right? It's not setting laws. Um, so for them to call a hearing to review their resolution and ask for public comment on their resolution, calling on Congress to make changes in the child nutrition programs, um, that was a really a, a tremendous effort on their part. It was very nice of them to do that. <laughs> That's what I'm, trying to say. Um, so in about August of 2009, Chris Quinn and Senator Gillibrand um, held, a, held a press conference. Um, Christine Quinn introduced a five-point platform um, of things that she would like to see change in the child nutrition program, very similar to the goals that I shared earlier. Um, and Senator Gillibrand introduced her um, proposal to, to align the um, reimbursement that the federal government gives to school districts with the cost of living in that area. Um, so this was a moment for New York to kind of gather around this issue, and the momentum continued from there. Um, the city council uh, has a legislative action center, I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, currently uh, they, they have something around, I think, Planned Parenthood up there. You might have seen that in the news. Um, so at that time, they, they posted a page on the child nutrition reauthorization. And there's a link there for um, citizens to kind of click through and send a letter to their Congress members. So this may not seem like a huge deal, but actually for the city council to, to take so much effort around federal legislation, um, it's a, it was a big thing. Um, the, uh, the Manhattan Borough President's Office under Scott Stringer spearheaded a sign-on letter for New York City and New York State representatives. Um, calling on, again, our, um, our Congress members to make changes to this legislation. Again, kind of a, just a gesture of support. Um, and they worked with us to outline their goals, which I'm not sure if I have the rest up here, but they, they aligned very closely with the goals that I, that I outlined earlier around child hunger, childhood obesity, supporting farm economies, and so forth. Um, and the mayor's office, um, the mayor's office sent quite a few letters to Congress um, and would have done that anyway. <laughs> um, and I wonder if people are aware of the controversy that came up at the end of this reauthorization process around cutting funds from the SNAP or food stamp program to pay for child nutrition. Okay. Um, that was a really difficult moment um, across the country, but especially so for New York in particular because we also have seen our participation in SNAP rise dramatically um, from about 1.3 million about a year and a half ago to 1.8 million now. Um, so the SNAP program is vital for all localities, but New York also. And so at the time when that proposal was on the table, um, the mayor sent this letter to the House asking them to reject that proposal by the Senate. Um, and I believe that was in the New York Times aware. Um, so there's my contact information if you would like to um, check out the website that we have for NYC for CNR, which is, um, you know, kind of ended at the moment that the bill passed. Um, but I'm happy to answer any more questions, but I just wanted to give a sense of kind of what New York City government did. They really 
um, they really took on this issue and, and took a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of staff time to kind of find out what was happening with the legislation and to share the updates that were coming out of our alliance with their networks. Um, Christine Quinn did um, a letter signing campaign with community members where I remember during one week, her staff people took just a stack of letters to every meeting that she went to and whatever she was talking about, she would also ask people to sign the letter and they collected about 870 letters and sent them off to Congress. Um, so it was really kind of a, a, an extraordinary effort on the part of New York City government. Thank you for your nice remarks about the Illumination Fund. Um, I founded the Illumination Fund in 2007, and um, I didn't have a specific goal, but I knew, I, I thought about the things that were important to me, um, the way that I was raised and the way that my children were raised, and um, I realized that, that I, although I didn't know exactly what areas I was gonna be in, the thing that I felt most strongly about was access and opportunity. I know the kind of education that my children had and didn't think it was right that just because of the circumstances of their birth, they were entitled to um, certain um, privileges and, and things that other New Yorkers didn't have. So the mission of the, um, the Laurium Tisch Illumination Fund is access <coughs> and opportunity, <coughs> mostly based in New York City. And the way that we do that is by supporting innovative solutions um, in addressing long-standing problems in New York City. Um, and it, it, as I said, I didn't know exactly where I was going when I founded the, um, the, the Illumination Fund, but the areas that I had been interested in were education, the arts, and healthy lifestyles, as well as public service. Um, and m some of you know I had founded the Children's Muse Museum of Manhattan about 25 years ago. Um, and I'm also involved, uh, I'm Vice Chair of Lincoln Center in the Whitney and um, have recently um, given the illumination lawn in Lincoln Center, that big green lawn, um, yeah. And again, the way that that came into the, um, to the illumination fund is that it's public access, it's a public lawn and, and available for everybody. Well, maybe not dogs, but everybody else. <laughs> and people eating messy food. <laughs> no, it's totally public. Um, so in 2008, um, when I had just, soon after I had founded the fund, my um, then director said, the mayor just called and he wants you to go to a bill signing. I had no idea why I was invited, but I liked the mayor and I liked Gracie, Gracie Mansion, um, or City Hall. At the time it was City Hall. It was City Hall, so I went. And what the bill signing was, uh, was um, that a bill had, that had been going through uh, with city council for quite a while to, that I actually was not aware of to change the law so that a thousand green carts, the fruits and vegetable carts, could be um, on the streets of New York in the areas that Pam showed, um, the areas known as food deserts. Um, and as, as Pam talked about, these food deserts were very closely correlated to areas of great uh, health problems, diabetes and obesity. Um, and what made this such a big deal, which I, now I'm an expert in, in food, in street vending, but at the time I didn't realize that, um, what made this such a big deal was that there were lines and lines of people waiting to get vending permits on the streets. And there's only one department for all of the permits, whether it's hot dogs, pretzels, haagen purses, gloves, socks. It's, it all goes under the same permit, and there are many, many people waiting to get them. So what made this law so significant was that the people who were willing to sell fruits and vegetables to establish their own green cards got to jump to the front of the line. Um, and there are certain, um, I don't remember exactly what it is, but um, there are certain things that veterans and, and um, some other groups can, you know, go right to the front of that. So, um, I, so then uh, the Department of Health then came to me with a proposal, and it was, I had just started the foundation, and it was much, much bigger than I had expected, um, and I couldn't quite understand what it had to do with the Illumination Fund. Um, and then I realized it fit in perfectly. It was all about um, 
bringing fresh fruits and vegetables or really access to fresh fruits and, and vegetables an opportunity where they didn't exist to um, areas of high poverty where there was a great um, amount of diabetes and obesities. Um, so I took on the whole project. I gave a $1.5 million grant to uh, the Department of Health. Um, and, the, and what the grant was, uh, I'm sorry, to the um, New, York, New York City, uh, the Mayor's Fund for Green Cards, I guess, or the Mayor's Fund for something. Um, and what this, where this money went was in several different areas. It went to Axion to be able to provide low cost loans. It went to design the umbrellas. Um, and when, if you'll see a lot, you know, people might be thinking, wait, I see fruit and vegetable carts all over the place. I see them in my neighborhood. But um, what makes this different is that these green carts and they have this special umbrella can only go into the designated areas that Pam showed. So part of the money went for the umbrella design, for the cart design, for marketing. And a big part of the money went to hire CARP resources, who, Pam, I think you worked with as well, who've been invaluable. Um, CARP resources were almost like a, a middleman. They, um, they work with the vendors. They help them uh, locate where to um, set up their carts. They take them to Hunts, um, Hunts Point Market, which, I've, as you've seen, is not very easy to negotiate. They introduce them to the wholesalers. They have many workshops. They've had, I went to um, a workshop with Produce Pete, and <laughs> who's now one of my great friends. And he talked about how he started selling tomatoes at four years old because he was cute. He went door to door, so they bought his tomatoes. Um, and he's been a tremendous resource. Um, and CARP continues to have workshops. They have them in different languages. They've hired a, Bengal a Bengali interpreter, um, and they've been terrific. Um, so the green carts are mobile food carts that sell fresh produce in designated areas that lack access to healthy food. And these are known as food deserts. Um, and the food deserts, there are several things that go into uh, describing what a, a food desert is. But basically, these are areas that have a high risk of uh, obesity and diabetes and lack alternatives lack alternatives um, to the fast, the fast food and the processed food that you see so much of. Now, you might have seen a little bit in the press uh, recently that you know, some of the uh, grocery stores or the you know, um, markets are saying they're hurting our business, they, you know, yeah. fresh foods. Um, so in a couple of cases, that may be true. Um, but the fact is that you know, studies were done most of these areas really have very, very little access. I, I didn't believe that it all fit into this neat little packet in the description that you um, showed. So when I first saw the, um, the proposal, I actually went up to um, several areas. I went to the South Bronx and several other areas. And you just see fast food after fast food after fast food. The super, we did go into the supermarkets and we saw you know, carrots that were the size of this room. And <laughs> blueberries with fur coats, um, <laughs> and it wasn't a cold time of year, so <laughs> that wasn't why they were wearing them. So you know, there is some. You know, there are places where there is some access, but it's certainly not the kind of access that most of us have in our neighborhoods. Um, you know, in my little na neighborhood alone, I know that there are a couple of Korean markets, three grocery stores within ten block radius, a couple of you know, a couple of green cards. So it's a little bit of a bogus argument. Um, and then when pressed, are they actually losing business? You know, we haven't really gotten the numbers. We're certainly looking into it. Um, a, a couple of, about six months ago, we did a partnership with Montefiore Hospital. And they, um, it, was, it was just when the green cards came out, maybe it was a couple of years ago. And they, they were checking blood pressure on the street. They were doing free blood pressure. And then they were giving um, a prescription for a green card. And the green card owner then gave an apple or a pear or whatever. And at the time, a New York Times, and this is on our website, at the time, a New York Times article was there. And he interviewed a guy who had a bodega right next door. And he was, he was very upset about the green card person being there. And he said, if he wasn't there, they'd come into my store and buy a Coca-Cola. 
So, <laughs> so you can decide yourself if you think that's a valid argument. Um, so as of January 31st, 2011, 566 permits have been issued and there are approximately 461 green cards uh, um, uh, deployed across the city. Um, about 10 of them are taking EBT um, and their business is, it, it's really helping their business. Um, I had asked the question why there aren't more that take EBT machines and they're just very expensive. Uh, you may know the price. I think they're about $500 or something each. So we're looking into finding grants so that more can take EBT. Um, they're they're um, very helpful. We've seen encouraging signs of um, people, you know, looking for, for uh, permits. The Department of Health will be doing a big study this summer. When they went in to determine where the where the green card area should be, they did a very extensive study. I don't know if you've seen the study, but a very extensive study. How many portions of fruits and vegetables do you eat every day? And I'm um, asking those kind of questions. They'll be doing another study this summer. So we don't know, um, you know, we don't know exactly how, how much that's increased. We have some anecdotal information. Um, but basically one of the best ways of knowing um, if it's successful is by talking to the vendors themselves. And these are private, privately owned businesses. The city and my grant does not support the, um, the businesses. So the fact that there are 460, 460 something on the streets, you know, to us shows that it's working. Um, they, and, you know, it's a very, very hard way to make a living. They have to go to Hunts Point at four in the morning. They're out there all day. It's not the best weather often. Um, and then they've got to <clears throat> store their carts at night. So it's a tough way to make a living, um, but you know, a lot are doing it. So we, um, and so, in a, so I became, this was not an area that I knew very much about, but I became so interested in the whole um, area of health and nutrition and um, access, you know, access to food that after I started the green cards, I then developed a whole uh, um, a whole initiative in my foundation ab about the whole area, not just the the green cards. Um, and one of the things I thought was most important to do was not only to um, have the green cards, but to have people know what to do with them. Um, you know, we thought, well, if there hasn't been very much access, you're not going to see a big head of cauliflower or kale and say, cauliflower, great. <laughs> so I thought what we should do is do some kind of a cookbook. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, we um, came out with a cookbook, and I've underwritten uh, 10,000 of them, and you can um, download it on the website, or if you send Pam um, an email, we'll be happy to give them to you. Um, the, the cookbooks are free, and we actually may, we may do another printing. And the point of the, the original point of the cookbook was to give to the vendors so that they can give them out to their customers. Um, and we've spoken to the vendors and, you know, people love them. They've increased um, their sales quite a bit. I sent, I sent emails to, I don't know, about 20 chefs asking if they would participate in the cookbooks. They all wrote back right away, including Senator Gillibrand, who, as you mentioned, is, has been a big supporter of this whole area. So Senator Gillibrand and um, Commissioner Thomas Farley did the, the forward to the cookbook. Um, and it's, it's um, so we have so, some celebrity chefs. We have Marcus Samuelson and Tom Colicchio and, and Jonathan Waxman. But we also wanted it to be much more broad-based. So two of the vendors, uh, Gloria Lima and Muhammad Ali, and he says he's the real Muhammad Ali. Um, that's his name, so I guess he is. Um, have, have recipes. Um, we do some work with Food and Finance High School. They have a recipe. We uh, do some work with the Sylvia Center. Uh, they have a recipe. Um, my daughter was in law school with uh, a young Korean man who has now become a big food star, Eddie Huang, and he has a recipe. So we tried to make it very broad-based. Uh, by the summer, we're taking five of the kind of top recipes and translating them into Spanish and giving out recipe cards. Uh, th uh, through some research, we've learned that 40% of the vendors are in areas that are primarily Spanish-speaking or very heavily Spanish-speaking. 
Um, so that's the cookbook, and uh, we'll probably do another printing because so many people have asked for them. Um, we're, we're now looking into working with um, the housing authority and um, making them part of the school lunch program and, and really um, getting them out. So that's kind of um, an example of where, you know, relatively small amount of money has, has leveraged, you know, over and over. Um, early on, when I started to go out to the green carts and meet some of the vendors, and, and us, um, I realized that this program really needed to be documented. So I also gave a, um, a grant to Aperture and, and asked them to, to document this. They then sent out an RFP to a, about a dozen or so photographers and ended up with six photographers who spent about a year documenting um, the program. And I'm very proud to say that uh, about three weeks ago, a big exhibit opened at the Museum of the City of New York of their work. Um, I was there yesterday, it's spectacular. And each of the photographers, I think, yeah, if you go to the uh, aperture, each of the photographers focused on a different area. Some focused on the food desert, some focused on who the customers were. Um, and the work is spectacular and there is this, uh, one of my favorite anecdotes was there is uh, Gabriella Stabile, a young uh, Italian photographer. Um, he focused on the customers and he kept going back and back to you know, befriend the customers. You know, they were cautious and they didn't know who he was. And they also get tickets a lot if their umbrellas aren't perfect or if they have cut up food. I mean, the, the city's rather harsh on them because, you know, people, the, some of the, you know, owners of the stores call and ask to get them tickets. So they're, you know, it's, they're having a hard time, but, they're, but CARP is helping them to work through it. So they're a little bit cautious. So Gabriella kept going back and back and befriending the customers. So early on, this I think about two years ago, I guess it was early November, and there were some customers that he had befriended buying a lot of fr uh, vegetables, fruit around Thanksgiving, and they said to him, where are you going to th for Thanksgiving? He said, I'm Italian, I don't know about Thanksgiving. So they said, well, come to our house. So <laughs> I think he's got some pictures there, and then another one of the photographers uh, befriended um, two Bengali vendors, and he spent a lot of time in their home, um, and his pictures focus on that. So it, it's really a very nice story. Um, so I urge you to go to the Museum of the City of New York. The exhibit is there until July 22nd. And they did a beautiful job. They start the exhibit by showing the whole um, history of New York City with uh, vending, mobile vendors. Many people, including me, have grandparents who were vendors. Um, so is that? Oh, so those are some of the photographs. But that's not all. Um, we also, I, I also then had the idea of doing a documentary. So there's, and the documentary is better than I could have imagined. It's premiering at the Aspen Institute on June 29th. Um, and the point of view of the documentary, I just knew that this was something that really should be captured, you know, starting with the city council hearings and which were apparently very, very heated. It was before I, um, came in, um, you know, one of the councilmen said, well, poor people don't want to eat fruits and vegetables. I mean, if there was, if there was a demand for it, then the supermarkets would be there. Um, <laughs> so there were, there were different points of view. Um, well, actually, he was the only one with that point of view, but there were, um, but it was a hard law to get passed. Um, so there was the city council hearings and, the, and, and, there was just a lot that went into it. It didn't just happen. So Mary Mazio, a documentary producer, uh, produced um, a film that, again, you can look on my website and you'll see the, um, the trailer for it called Apple Pushers. And what she did is focus on five immigrants um, who became vendors. And it's a wonderful story, and I'll leave it at that. Um, so that's the Greens Card story. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Sharon Wong and I have a really cool job. I am the Community Development Manager at New York City Food and Fitness Partnership. And food, the partnership is actually an alliance funded by the Kellogg Foundation and um, is governed by three nonprofits, Brooklyn Rescue Mission, 
city harvest and transportation alternatives. And um, the Alliance is also comprised of community groups, community organizations, policymakers, and individuals all working to improve the access to healthy food, increase opportunities for active living, especially in underserved communities. And right now our focus community is Central Brooklyn. So um, another thing that the partnership really tries to do is promote policy and system change. And our work is in three specific areas, community food, school food, active living. And in those areas, we really um, try to incorporate youth in that work as much as possible. So today I'm going to talk to you specifically about our work with young people um, in the city and how we try to get them involved in policy and systems change. So first I should say and acknowledge that there are a lot of young people doing amazing work around food issues in the city. Um, you know, and I, through my job, I have the opportunity to meet a lot of those um, amazing young people. And what they're doing is they are starting and managing community and school gardens and actually growing food in their communities. They're um, addressing high rates of obesity and diabetes through developing um, nutrition educational programs in their schools or after school programs. They are also um, working in pantries to feed the hungry. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of you may be familiar with organizations like East New York Farms, um, which is a group that we work with closely. They're are organizations like Brooklyn Rescue Mission who has their own youth program and young people there are working in pantries. And um, another amazing group is Brotherhood Sister Soul in East Harlem that has its own edible garden and amazing outdoor facility that also um, incorporates or provides space for physical activity for young people. So even though there's all this amazing work happening um, in the city that young people are spearheading, you know, we still, they could still do a lot more. And um, one of the things that I'm learning by working in the partnership is that in order to let young people do more and to hear their voices is that we really need to create more spaces for them to network with other young people throughout the city and spaces where they can develop leadership skills and have access to information on existing campaigns and initiatives in the city and also opportunities to brainstorm and think of ideas to be a part of those campaigns. So um, more recently, the partnership had to kind of rethink how we work with youth. Um, you know, we are a small staff and we do a lot of our work by partnering, which is <laughs> in our name. And one of the things that we realized immediately is that we didn't want to recreate some kind of youth project that's already existing in the city. Um, and also we didn't want to pull young people from their existing programs. So what we decided to do is to host three youth events each year and create that space for young people to gather and to share what they're doing in the city, share their different practices, and to brainstorm and create a citywide event that will attract their peers. And that event would not only expose them to citywide issues um, regarding food, but also give them opportunities to network, brainstorm, and think of some action steps and campaigns. So I'm going to ask um, Kristen, thank you, to pull up our page. Actually, can we show the other link first um, on that document? the bottom one. Um, so I'm proud to say we um, hosted our first youth event in January 
but I want to show you guys some pictures from the planning process. So, um, yeah, I think you could do a slideshow. So for our January youth event, um, El Puente was one organization that came together and worked with us, Brotherhood Sisters Soul, um, Brooklyn Rescue Mission. And um, when we do these planning meetings, um, we definitely want youth, but often too, young people, young adults come and participate in the dialogue. So we do encourage an intergenerational interaction um, in the planning process. So you see here us, we're actually at City Harvest um, using one of their conference room spaces. And, um, you know, giving young people the chance to talk about issues that they see in their community around community food, school food, and active living. And um, they were actually broken into working groups. And um, each working group had a specific task, whether to design the agenda of the day, whether to do outreach for the event. So these are just some pictures um, from the planning process. So what ended up happen happening, and you could do the other link, Kristen, sure. is this really cool um, youth event that took place in January at the Horticultural Society, where um, that planning group wanted to create an event where young people would enter the space and first go to different working stations. So we had three workstations, one on learning about sugar sweetened beverages, um, another on learning how to prepare healthy food. Teen Battle Chef was a participant <laughs> in that one. And then the other workstation was working with youth from Brotherhood Sister Soul and learning how to create an edible garden. So yeah, young people came into the space. It was very hands-on. You could see they got me involved in activities immediately. <laughs> and um, after we went through the work stations, we watched the film, What's on Your Table? Um, it was one that they chose as a great educational tool that actually connects a lot of youth work to the larger food system. So it was an amazing event. Um, we ended with very interesting discussions. Young people were very excited to share their work in their community and also um, open or requested opportunities to collaborate with other groups that came to the event. So we're following up with some of those collaboration ideas and um, actually in the process of planning our next event, which will hopefully take place in June. So, you know, one thing I wanna end with is that um, what we're learning, you know, when it comes to policy and systems change, again, is you know, a lot of young people are doing it. Um, in our January event, one group came from the Bronx District Public Health Office and their youth advisory board, they did the sugar sweetened beverage um, workstation. And I'm seeing more of that. A lot of the district public health offices are forming youth groups. And those youth groups are learning about citywide campaigns, whether you agree with those campaigns or not. But <laughs> they are, um, the ones who are interested are learning about them and figuring out ways to incorporate that information into their schools, into events like ours. Um, also, you know, there are a lot of young people that are involved in community assessments, mapping projects, and surveys, and doing data collection. Um, it would be great to, you know, for the partnership to figure out ways to get that information to policymakers. You know, having young people create their own policy recommendations would be very exciting to see in the near future. Um, also, what's really exciting is um, young people, I think, are recognizing their power as consumers and are expressing their dissatisfaction with the food that they're seeing and also coming up with these great ideas of changing it. So, 
you know, the partnership, we're really um, excited to go out and meet these young people and also use our resources to connect them to other organizations, policymakers, and see if they can have more of a visible presence in shaping our um, food system. So thank you. Thank you.